Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Carolina Science Cafe for the month of June. This is actually the what traditionally is the last cafe of the academic year. What a bizarre and strange uh, academic year it's been. A few months ago, we were slated to host tonight's topic with our uh, illustrious speaker, Dr. Bin Gu, and um, we were rescheduled because we wanted to shift to questions around the coronavirus. And now, three months later, things have only seemed to have gotten more intense and more bizarre. We hope you're doing as well as can be. My name is Jonathan Frederick. I am the Senior Manager of Programs and Strategic Partnerships at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill's Moorhead Planetarium and Science Center. Um, best wishes to you and yours. I'm in my basement. Um, I have a three-year-old and a five-year-old in my home. And as I've been working from home, this is the corner, the game corner is where I get a chance to to, to, um, to do a little bit of work and maybe play a little Settlers of Catan when I'm, when I'm feeling up for it, but, um, or Catan, depending on what, where you're from or how, how hard you believe in that game. But um, anyway, I hope you're all doing well. We miss you. Um, we typically do these science cafes in um, a bar in downtown Chapel Hill, North Carolina. It's Back Bar, which is part of Top of the Hill Restaurant, which is sort of a, an iconic institution in, in Chapel Hill, when you're, uh, when you're, uh, when parents drop off their children to matriculate at the University of North Carolina, they're probably going to have a bite to eat at Top of the Hill because it's uh, this great corner restaurant at the main street, at main intersection, and there's this overlooking uh, outdoor patio where you can people watch. And uh, we just want to say hello to the team at Back Bar, to, to Jeff and, and Scott and Alex and everyone there. Thank you. We miss you. Um, but that's typically where we are. Um, and we have an expert give a talk every month um, to a, a crowd of people who just want to have an intellectual evening out. And the goal of these programs is really to break down barriers and filters, to connect people so that they can talk to one, each other, one, uh, one another or to each other about important science topics. And people can feel heard. Experts can hear what um, the general public thinks about their work. Um, they can dispel uh, any misconceptions, and they can also uh, dispel some of their own misconceptions or preconceptions about what the general public knows or does not know about what they do. Um, there are a lot of folks involved in the production of an event like this. Uh, the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill is our parent institution, but we are based out of um, Moorhead Planetarium and Science Center, which is uh, just a, a, a little powerhouse of a mid-sized science center that serves the entire state of North Carolina for through uh, rigorous outreach programs um, through uh, some really dynamic and incredible planetarium shows, sky watching sessions all over the state. Um, we really see our mission is to serve the state through science, health and technology education. And um, these are meant to be exciting times. We are um, planning, uh, for years we've been planning a, a reopening, a grand reopening. It's gonna happen this fall. And so the building's being renovated um, there are new exhibits going in, and we're really going to um, sort of take our mission to another level. So we're excited to see you in person as we, as we reopen. And I encourage you to check out our website for updates, moreheadplanetarium.org. Um, there's also Moorhead at Home, which is a whole new series of virtual programming and content that we've added. Um, other partners involved in this include UNC Chapel Hill's uh, Chapter of Sigma Xi, which is a scientific society that really celebrates researchers. I encourage you to check out Sigma Xi online, and we just want to say hello to Richard and Drew and David and the whole team involved with Sigma Xi. And that's just a few of the names. There's a number of folks who help us and support us in celebrating science and connecting it to the general public. Um, since we're not doing that and we're doing a virtual iteration of the Science Cafe, what we want to do is still keep that dialogue going. Um, but uh, we have to sort of manage that, right? It can't be just a free-for-all. As much as I like rowdy free-for-alls, um, because of the format and the medium, it gets a little tricky. So what we want you to do is ask away, ask questions at any point during uh, Ben's talk and put those in the Q&A section of uh, the, if you kind of take your little uh, mouse and go down to the bottom, if you're unfamiliar with Zoom, most of us probably are fatigued with Zoom, but if you're unfamiliar with Zoom, you go down, there's a Q&A section, you can click on that um, and enter your questions there. And I'll be keeping an eye on that to, to translate or to send those questions to Ben so he can answer those. Um, that's one way you can do it. If you get stuck and you wanna use the chat, we'll be watching both, but we do encourage you to use the Q&A feature. Um, 
and, and ask, ask away, ask all sorts of questions. Um, there is a person behind the scenes I do want to acknowledge. It's Eric McIntosh, our uh, program manager. He manages the North Carolina Science Festival. He's worked uh, for NOAA. He's led national uh, programs. He's done some incredible work with, um, with Moorhead uh, before that as both uh, a, a, an early career employee and as an undergraduate at uh, UNC. So we're really lucky to have him. And um, I don't know if I forgot anything, Eric. So I don't know if you just want to just drop in <laughs> and then just say hello and let me and just see if I, I left anything out. Nope, sounds good. I think you've got, you've got it all covered. All right, so that's Eric. Thanks, buddy. I uh, appreciate it. From Mebane, Eric's broadcasting from Mebane, North Carolina, um, and he's been doing an incredible job for us. Um, tonight's topic is uh, one I'm really excited to engage. Um, CBD oil is something uh, some of you have been um, probably know more, way more than me about. Um, but I've just noticed uh, over the past, I guess I'd say year and a half, that um, I've seen, I, I've experienced conversations around CBD oil. I've had um, family members and friends of mine uh, sort of espouse its virtues. Others express skepticism. We've seen articles. Um, I have uh, people who swear by it. I, I, I know people who, uh, who, um, who are curious. Um, and I think it's one of those really perfect topics for a science cafe because we oftentimes wanna know if there's something in the public sort of arena, what do researchers say? What do people trained in, um, in testing questions think about this? What is the real evidence we have for any assumptions we have about something like this? And as uh, usually happens, when I start poking around on a topic, I can look in the backyard of Moorhead Planetarium and Science Center, which happens to be the campus of UNC Chapel Hill. Um, I can find some incredible story or research team that's doing some work on this topic that, that, that I'm curious about engaging in. And I found an article that was published by the UNC School of Medicine about how CBD uh, can alleviate seizures potentially and benefit people with neurodevelopmental conditions. And I reached out to the lab team and, and, and Dr. Bingu was gracious enough to say, yes, this is something we'd want to do. I would be happy to share uh, some of our findings and answer questions people have about this topic. Um, and like I said earlier, we were going to do this in February. We decided to bump this. So I first want to express my appreciation to Ben for being flexible um, and being willing to do this. And on top of that, he just reminded me that this week is when UNC is reopening all the research labs uh, to get back to some semblance of, of, of normal. And it's, it's come without some really significant logistical challenges. So I'm really grateful for Dr. Gu to be here. And he is a postdoctoral researcher in the Philpot lab here on campus. Uh, and when I say here on campus, I do want to remind because it's virtual, I forget. Uh, here on campus means at UNC Chapel Hill. And from here, I'll turn it over to, to Ben and let him explain um, and answer the question he posed. Is CBD oil a therapeutic cure-all? Um, so Ben, take it away. And I, and I applaud you and thank you for being here. <laughs> thank you so much. Can everyone hear me okay? Good. Okay. So um, go ahead first, share the screen. Thank you, Jonathan, for the nice introduction and thank you all for having me. I'm really excited to be here today to share with you my work and vision on CBD and the potential medical benefits of CBD with all of you. I know it's really a hard time, so I hope you enjoy your dinner, grab a bottle of beer, make your cocktail, and just relax through. Uh, well, I take you through this journey of CBD. So uh, I received my PhD from Duke University in pharmacology. So I am literally a doctor, but not the doctor in hospital. So the reason why I'm here today is not to give you any medical advice, but to show you some scientific evidence of CBD that support its potential medical use. Uh, so to start with, I would like to everybody to 
participate to just name the CBD related products uh, that that you ever seen or ever used. For example, here uh, I have some examples, but I guess the CBD related products are more than that. So we really can't deny CBD is really a hot topic in both public and scientific communities. For example, if you go to a farmer's market, you won't be surprised to see a booth selling CBD related products. And also there's CBD store in Franklin Street. And uh, right before Christmas, I went to RDU and I was surprised to see there's a convenience store at RDU selling CBD related products. So, you know, the things like they sell in an, in an airport are either essential or like a good gift. So I saw a lot of CBD oil, CBD gummies. I don't know what the audience say. Well, Ben, I, I'm, I'm a, you know, sometimes I use these as a chance just to ask my own questions. And, and, mm -hmm. and everyone, you can drop uh, some of the products you've heard of uh, or are wondering about in the chat. Um, is that a mask or an eyeliner? Mascara? Yes. <laughs> what is that? It sounds a little bit crazy, but I saw CBD shampoo and CBD soap. Uh, there's a lot like uh, healthcare related products uh, uh, advertised containing CBD, but I, n I never saw <laughs> such things. Uh, Someone else references sleep gummies? Yes, uh, since CBD was advertised can improve sleep. Uh, there's some like foods and treats that show they contain CBD and also uh, believe it or not there's CBD treats for your pals because CBD has been shown can reduce anxiety so it will be a good idea to give your dog some CBD treats before the night of uh, thunderstorm. Yeah, there's, wow, that's a great idea. There's another question that I, I know you want to get through some, some mm -hmm. stuff about your research, but Richard wants to know if CBD oil from commercially produced uh, entities, do you know if they can penetrate the skin to affect muscles or ligaments? I think I will cover that topic later about right. like uh, the root of the CBD that you can take either through mouth or transdermal. Great. Uh, so let me talk about cannabis oil or CBD. There's a twin molecule that called THC that you may heard before, or tetrahydrocannabinol if you prefer the fancier name. Actually, CBD and THC are two naturally occurring cannabinoids that found in the cannabis plant you see they have the exact same molecular formula and they have the exact same molecular weight. So, so probably it's a fun activity for you guys to try to spot the chemical difference between CBD and THC by looking at the chemical structure on the left of CBD and on the right of THC. Anybody, anybody has any? Idea, I spy. So if not, just look at this small difference between these two molecules. Basically, CBD has a hydroxy group instead of a cyclic ring in THC. Just this small difference that makes THC psychoactive, whereas CBD is not psychoactive. In other words, C THC can really make you high, whereas CBD uh, can calm you down. So uh, let me... Uh... You have a background in pharmacology. I'm curious. Um, so you said uh, the hydroxy group is all it takes to make this molecule. And I guess one thing to point out is this is a flat 
diagram, but this molecule is in three dimensions. This is yes. just sort of a, almost like an architectural drawing of it. Yes, that's but, just this my difference. Okay, but it makes it something about psycho, what, what, what makes something psychoactive? What does it mean to be psychoactive? That, that means it can, makes you feel high and uh, it makes you addicted to, to this drug because it can make you high. <laughs> And uh, when we talk about CBD and cannabis, there's a lot other terminology you may hear or words uh, like hemp, marijuana, cannabis sativa, cannabis indica. These terminologies and nomenclature sometimes can really be confusing. So basically cannabis is a genus of a flowering plant. Whereas cannabis sativa and cannabis indica are just uh, two species of cannabis. Basically, uh, cannabis sativa has narrow leaves and they are tall and slim built. Indica have wide leaves and short and bushy bills. So, and a rule of thumb is sativa usually have higher THC CBD ratio, whereas indica have lower THC and CBD ratio. And of course, there are more than hundreds of hybrids uh, species between sativa and indica. And hemp and marijuana basically are the broad classification that have adopted in our culture. So they are not legitimate nomenclature for cannabis. And uh, hemp, they are most used for the industrial purpose, for their oil and fiber, and they contain a uh, lower amount of THC, whereas marijuana is for the recreational use, they contain higher amount of THC. Uh, just a brief history of the medical use of cannabis and CBD. Uh, actually, it's now new to use CBD for their medical benefits in Asia, more than thousands of years ago, there's like written record to use cannabis for the medical purpose. But uh, scientists has little uh, idea about the molecular stru structure of CBD until 1963, when they found the structure of CBD. But there's a rocket rise of the public interest in the medical use of CBD around 2010 because of a story of a little girl hit the headline of national news. So for you who don't know Shattered Figgy, she was born with a rare genetic disorders of epilepsy. So by, he, by she was four years old, she experienced more than 300 seizures a week. And her mom tried different medications, none of them work. And uh, the desperate mom finally tried CBD oil in Charlotte, and they found the CBD oil can really control the seizures. Uh, but uh, unfortunate, unfortunately, Charlotte Figgy passed away early this year uh, due to the COVID-related pneumonia. But her story really inspired scientists pharmaceutical company to perform the preclinical and clinical study and finally lead FDA to approve CBD for the treatment of two rare form of pediatric seizures. Uh, so CBD has been really advertised as a therapeutic cure -all. For example, in addition to epilepsy, uh, CBD has been advertised can improve sleep reduce anxiety, relieve pain. And I recently saw a news that FDA issued a warning letter to a company that tried to advertise CBD can, pre, can pro, protect people from contract COVID-19. And, but among these potential beneficial effect, most of them are solely based on the personal experience and anecdotal report but only anti-seer or anti-epileptic effect of CBD has been carefully studied in both preclinical and clinical settings. So 
All right, I would like you to just repeat that because I think that's a really important point. The only thing that you think science has really validated is it's with, with related to epilepsy. Yes. Great. Because Thanks. that's why FDA only approved CBD for the treatment of two seizure related uh, disorders. So here is a scientific paper. I hope you can uh, work together with me through this data. This is very simple. And uh, basically what the scientists do is to test the effect of CBD in a mouse model of Dravet syndrome. And what they measure here is the effect of CBD on seizure duration, seizure severity, and the frequency of the seizures. And they have some groups uh, representative, uh, in, represented in this bar graph. They have a VEH that is vehicle treated group. Basically, this is a control group in blue. And they have CBD treated groups uh, in various uh, dose from 10 to 200 milligram per kilogram. And what they found is they found 100 and 200 milligram per kilogram CBD have a robust anti seizure effect. Uh, here you see they can shorten the seizure duration and reduce the seizure severity. And also here shows they can reduce the seizure frequency. So this is the experiment that the scientist treated the CBD in a mouse model of Dravet syndrome. And uh, I forgot to mention earlier that shattered figgy, it was actually diagnosed with Dravet syndrome. That's why the scientists want to use the mouse model of Dravet syndrome to study the beneficial effect of CBD. And along with this preclinical study of CBD in mice, there's a uh, clinical study that tests the effect of CBD in Dravet syndrome patients. So this is a double-blinded placebo-controlled clinical study. That means neither the doctor nor patients know what they got from, um, from the, the bottle. And here shows the cannabidiol CBD can significantly reduce the frequency of the seizures by about 40% versus the placebo group. There's about 10% reduction of the seizure frequency. So basically this preclinical and clinical study of CBD finally fuel FDA to approve CBD for the treatment for this disorder. So the exciting study that I would like to talk about today uh, carried out actually right here at UNC Chapel Hill. This is a collaborative uh, research uh, project that we evaluate the clinical effect of CBD in Angelman syndrome model mice. Uh, this study is in collaboration with Dr. The field power lab at the Department of Cell Biology and Physiology and Neuroscience Center, and Dr. Paul Carney at the Department of uh, Neurology. And this research would not be possible without the funding from Andromin Syndrome Foundation, American Epilepsy Society, and NIH. So, for you who are not familiar with Andromin Syndrome, Andromin Syndrome is a neuronal developmental disorder that first described by a British doctor, Harry Andrewman, as what he called a puppet children. So Andrewman syndrome happens in about in one in every 12,000 people and is characterized by happy demeanor, developmental delay, lack of speech, motor impairment, e.g. abnormality, and highly penetrant epilepsy with over 90% of Andrewman syndrome patients have seizures. And also the seizures happens in many different types and happens early in Andromin syndrome patients with over one third of them start their first seizures in the febrile, in the setting of the febrile illness. That means 
uh, when uh, Andromeda syndrome patients have fevers, it's highly likely that will trigger uh, seizures in, in Andromeda syndrome kids. So in order to study the Andromeda syndrome patients, uh, we used the mouse model to mimic Andromeda syndrome. And this mouse model showed enhanced susceptibility of the seizures triggered by a loud noise or by increased body temperatures. So our study, uh, our goal is to evaluate the effect of CBD in the Andromeda syndrome model mice. So uh, the model we used is very simple. So basically we trigger the seizures in mouse by expose them to a very loud noise. And uh, here is WT stands for the wild type. Basically it's a control group. We see uh, wild type mice did not show any behavior seizures after they exposed to the loud noise. Whereas the Andromin syndrome AS mice showed severe behavior seizures after they exposed to the loud noise. However, if you treat the Andromeda syndrome model mice with CBD, we can see there's a really a dose dependent anti-seizure effect here with the higher dose at 100 milligram per kilogram and shows significant uh, anti-seizure effect. Basically, a lot of these mice are seizure free after they received the treatment of CBD. In addition to this uh, audiogenic seizure, we also test the effect of CBD in another seizure induction paradigm called the hyperthermia induced seizures. To do this, basically, we increase the body temperature of the mice and see uh, at what body temperature they started to show seizures and uh, whether CBD can reduce the seizure duration and the seizure severity. What we found here is that the CBD did not affect the body temperature when they start showing the seizure phenotype, but CBD can really reduce the seizure duration and the seizure severity. And in addition to its uh, anti-seizure or anti-convulsant effect, we are also tested whether CBD can like uh, calm the mice down to see whether they show any sedative effect. So the experimental paradigm we use here is called open field test. Basically this test monitor the local motor activity of the mice. And the, what we measure here is very simple. It's basically measure how far they traveled in one hour in this open field. And uh, we see here that CBD exhibit a strong sedative effect in both control mice and endomy syndrome model mice that suggest, for example, this uh, 100 milligram per kilogram CBD, which can inhibit seizure, they can also uh, like uh, make the mice travel less, like make the mice less active. So our study published in the Journal of Clinical Investigation caught a lot of attention and also sent a huge wave in the Andromeda syndrome community. And uh, basically our goal is uh, the clinical study can really help to shape the possible clinical trial. And uh, finally, we hope CBD can be approved by FDA for the treatment of Andromeda syndrome for, uh, for their seizures. There are some good questions in the chat, and I, I don't know if you have more to cover, but I do notice that there's a really important kind of qualifier in there with CBD may alleviate seizures. Is there, what does it take to get rid of that may and say CBD does, or is that even possible? Yes, uh, that's really a, a good question since uh, in addition to the seizures that we triggered using 
loud noise and uh, high body temperature, we also tested the effect of CBD in other serial induction paradigm. So because we know different seizure triggers, uh, they induce seizures through different mechanism. And uh, that's why we want to try different seizure induction paradigm. We found CBD only works in some seizure paradigm, but not in the others. So in other words, CBD may treat some type or some aspect of the seizures, but not the others. Actually, based on the clinical trial, CBD has been shown to be very powerful, or very effective for treating severe seizures or the seizures with uh, severe convulsions, but really not effective in treating local seizures or focal seizures uh, with those seizures that shows uh, very mild symptoms. Uh, so, so far there's like a lot of TBD for CBDs because we know it has powerful anti-epileptic or anti seizure effect, but uh, the targets of how the CBD uh, exhibits its anti seizure effect is really unknown. And here I have this table shows the potential targets of the CBD in the brain of uh, THC and CBD here, you see uh, basically CBD counteracts many effects of the THC and uh, uh, people believe it's like a multi-target effect of CBD and this biochemical uh, promiscuity probably make CBD so uh, medicinal uh, powerful that because epilepsy is also believed to be a network disorders. Since we talk about CBD, but uh, the CBD that I talk about in our research is the synthetic CBD. So basically they have very high Purity is 99.2% purity. And uh, the CBD that FDA approved for the treatment of Dravi and, uh, the, and another seizure uh, disorders, Epidiolex is plant-derived CBD. They have about 98% purity of CBD and a very low amount of THC. But I bet the CBD that you bought from internet or from the CBD store or CBD products or dietary supplements because FDA did not regulate the purity and safety of dietary supplement. I would like to say that the CBD that uh, you bought may not uh, have the active ingredients at the dose listed on the label because there's FDA warning letter show that there's very variant purity of CBD in the CBD products on the market and 70% of the CBD products are not accurately labeled. Hey, and, and, and sorry yes. to interrupt, but I think this is a few, uh, I think representative of a few of the questions that have come in that I think are, are on a lot of people's minds. Is, is there a way, uh, I'm gonna rephrase, I think Jonah Jim Evans asked this, but I'm gonna rephrase this a little bit to get it, um, I think where you're going is, is there a way to know that you're getting a high quality product? Like, is there a, um, if the FDA is not regulating this and you wanna get the good stuff, <laughs> it's gonna help you, is there a way to know if, if, if me as a, just a general consumer and not a scientist? It's really a hard question, I guess unless you send the product you bought to a laboratory to test the purity of the CBD, you never know what the content, like what the dose of CBD in the product you buy. And even worse, there might be residual THC in the product. 
that you buy that can make you high out even a dictate. And uh, some CBD product may contain other cannabinoids. There are over 100 cannabinoids found in the cannabis plants and uh, even contaminate with uh, heavy metals or pesticides, I would say. And also there's batch to batch variation. Even if you have your favorite uh, brand of CBD, because they are derived from the plant and uh, there's a huge batch to batch variation uh, in the CBD products. So here are some fre frequently asked questions of CBD. And if you have more questions, please free, uh, feel free to chime in. And uh, people ask about the toxicity profile of CBD and uh, uh, my personal opinion is that CBD has a relatively low toxicity profile compared to other commonly used anti-epileptic or anti-seizure drugs. Most of them are related to sleepiness and dizziness. Some uh, reported na nausea, vomiting, and, and uh, diarrhea, but uh, this also common in the placebo controlled group that might relate it to the uh, solvent that they use because CBD is dissolved in oil. And this uh, nausea vomiting symptom may be related to, to oil. And when we take the CBD from the mouth and uh, basically the the maximum dose and the, 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 the amount of the CBD that can get into your system really depend on your diet. And here there's a research show that the maximum dose of CBD or the maximum concentration of the CBD get into your system is 14 times higher if you take CBD with your food or if you are full versus if you take CBD when your stomach is empty. Uh, also because CBD is uh, oil soluble and uh, if you take CBD with a burger, you can get more CBD into your blood versus if you take a CBD with a low fat diet like a bowl of salad. And also CBD can interact with other drugs and also interact with some enzymes in your liver that metabolize some drugs because there's one research shows that CBD is an inhibitor of cytochrome P450. Cytochrome P450 is a major drug metabolism enzyme in your liver and uh, basically it can break down the drug of medication that you take. And uh, for example, if you take uh, warfarin, it's a medication to prevent blood clots. And in the same time, if you take CBD, it can basically inhibit the metabolism of the other drugs you take. In the case of warfarin, it can increase the risk of bleeding. And there's research also shows CBD can directly interact with other drugs that you take. So I guess the take home message is do consult your doctor before you're taking any uh, CBD related products and be aware of the quality of the product you take, be aware of the diet. Will you take CBD because if you eat fatty food, more CBD can get into your system versus if you eat a low fat diet. And also if you take other medications, uh, do consult your doctor before you take CBD. There is a question here that I think is pretty interesting uh, about uh, it's one we need to get back to, but another one from Kim. 
about um, if federal regulations hamper research or clinical trials using CBD. Is there anything more complicated about uh, what you're trying to research because it's CBD and, and, and uh, attached to marijuana? Uh, that's a very good question. Actually, at, like when we started this project two years ago, CBD is still a category one drug, so it's really hard to get it. We need to keep it in a locked box, in a locked freezer, and we need to sign up if we want to use any CBD product. But right now, they have downregulated the category of CBD to category five, so this allows more scientists to get access to CBD to study the potential medical benefit of CBD. And regarding to the federal regulation, there's a campaign about uh, using medical marijuana and CBD for treatment of different disorders. And it's really depend on the state. I would like to share with you one more slide. Uh, show that different policies and re regulation rules regarding to uh, CBD related products in, in America. This is a, a question that I think is a follow up that uh, maybe it's just me being curious, but is there anything, um, if you have federal funding and the federal laws are different than the state law. So you're in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, but is there any tension between how you'd research a controlled substance uh, depending on the state you're in, in, North, in the United States? Uh, I think for research, uh, it's CBD was category one like two years ago. Uh, I, and I believe the, the states that we uh, approved medical use of marijuana or CBD can get CBD through uh, companies and uh, maybe it's, I believe it will be easier for them to use CBD, but in North Carolina, we still need to uh, get through all those regulations uh, before we can get the CBD products. Gotcha, thank you. I do wanna circle back around to Richard's question because I'm not sure if we covered it, but you may have and I may have missed it, is uh, uh, about commercial CBD oil formulations uh, penetrating the skin to affect muscles or ligaments. And if not, are there any agents that help that happen? I know you talked about some topical stuff, but uh, I don't know if you can, is there any light you can shed on what his question? Can commercial CBD oil formulations penetrate the skin to affect muscles or ligaments? Um, I noticed there is some transdermal uh, CBD patch uh, uh, available and uh, I'm not quite familiar with CBD administrated through skin. And uh, we, in the mouse model, we direct they inject CBD into the mouse tummy to have a better control of the dose that we delivered. Gotcha. Um, my last question, an amazing presentation. Thank you so much. Um, Thanks. I'm, let's say I'm curious about CBD oil. I've heard that it may, relaxes me. I see a shop on Franklin Street that's opened up and is selling it. Not that you're supposed to advocate at any way, but what would you say to people who are thinking about um, trying it or uh, should people be trying it? Should they be waiting for more studies? Uh, I know it's tricky because I'm asking you to like sort of like <laughs> give advice, but I'm not asking for advice. I'm just sort of saying like, what do you feel comfortable saying about CBD oil? What's your take home message, I guess, about yes, I oil for us? Yes, I, I think in addition to FDA approved treatment of seizures using CBD oil in two specific seizure related syndromes, 
I would treat CBD just as a dietary supplement. And uh, uh, like I said, be aware of the quality of CBD that you take, be aware of uh, the diet uh, when you take CBD and also be aware of the interaction of the medications that you take while you take CBD. And uh, there's lots of clinical and uh, uh, related study shows showing the promising medicinal benefits of CBD. But this uh, still under investigation and uh, after careful clinical and clinical study, uh, the FDA can probably expand the treatment spectrum of CBD for more uh, disorders. You're getting me excited. Like I want to, I keep wanting to ask more questions. Um, I think the only one I, I'm trying to, I know you have to go and I, and I do, before we started, uh, Ben mentioned how the shifts have changed for how they're trying to open up the research labs and how people are working in 50% capacity of super early to super late. So I want to be sensitive to that, but I think, I guess uh, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't ask, um, based on what you just said, how can we as consumers or, um, just regular people who aren't trained in science, how can we stay on, where can we go to find accurate information about this? Do you have any sense of how we can stay informed? Is it the FDA? We just look for that label or what, what, what do you recommend we do? I think if you have any symptoms or disorders you want to treat seriously, just consult your doctors about this and uh, of course, you can go, go to the FDA website to check the recent update of the most uh, uh, recent clinical trials of CBD. I know there's ongoing clinical trials of CBD for treatment of rat syndrome. That's another neurodevelopmental disorder and uh, tuberal sclerosis. That also a disorder uh, with the comorbid of seizures. So always consult doctor and uh, see whether FDA approved CBD for the treatment of the symptoms that you uh, desire to use. That's great. And there is a comment that PubMed Central is a great place to search for recent and freely available scientific information. And we'll share that link out, which is a really, really good recommendation. Dr. Gu, thank you so much for uh, spending time with us. We know you're incredibly busy. We really appreciate you sharing your expertise and your passion for public outreach. We know you're incredibly busy and that you could have been uh, attending some other really important talks that are happening. Everyone else, uh, thank you so much. We are popping up a poll question on the screen if you wanna take time to, uh, to answer. We are trying to get a better sense of how many people are attending these talks. And um, we're really grateful to all of you. We hope you're doing as well as can be. Um, under these really strange, surreal, and uh, um, tragic times. So uh, we're thinking about you. We can't wait to see you in person. Be safe. Um, if you'd like to add your name to our listserv, you can drop your email address into our chat, and we'll catch on all that. Catch you up on all that. But um, Dr. Ben Gu, thank you so much. And thank uh, you all for having me. Yeah, and a comment says great talk, Ben, which I heartily second. Thank you. We really appreciate it. Have a great rest of your day, everybody. You Bye. Too. Thank you. Bye, everyone.